we are hoping to be able to um, be, have our the webinars on the portal. But for now, let's use the self-reporting mechanism. Um, I'd like to hand it over to our presenters to be able to introduce themselves and begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Charlie. Um, Gerald Momondi, physiotherapist, working in Kenyatta outpatient setting. Let me watch my watch my mwezangu pia as you introduce. Thank you very much, Gerald. Uh, my name is Wycliffe Tatayo Yadi, a physiotherapist uh, working uh, in level six orthopedics department, KNH. Thank you. We have other panelists are participating. Um, majorly now would be Emily Koske. Uh, someone else will be joining us will be Victor Boge and uh, Peter Araka. All of them are physiotherapists, sorry. Uh, hopefully with time, we'll also get the occupational therapists joining us for this webinars as we work together to improve matters economics. So I will start with my presentation. Pretty simple. On the page you're looking at, it's a brief detail as to what economics is in accordance with the Canadian Center of, for Occupational Health and Safety. But um, this is it. It's a brief introduction to basic economic training. And what we're covering today is simply musculoskeletal disorders. Our objective today simple, to define MSDs and their occurrences in the workplace, identify activities at work that could lead to risks of musculoskeletal disorders, and then identify primary risk factors that can contribute to the development of work-related MSDs. So quick check on the incidences of MSDs. Um, sorry, I did not write the reference, but this is from American uh, occupational and safety site. They say, in accordance with them, in 2000, um, people most affected by occupational injuries, which in, in that research was mostly strange as sprains or housekeeping, laundry, and food services, which we have a full, several departments covering that area in Kenyatta, patient care, which covers nurses, doctors, physios, occupational therapists, and the rest maintenance, central supplies, then the office settings. In the KNH setting, um, this is borrowed from the KPCC Economic CME 2018-2019. Big thanks to Alfred Mutua. Um, in the month of February in 2010, nine new admissions were done. Six were nurses with lower back pain and three were very staff with extremity pains. That tells you if in one month you have nine admissions, it's something worth looking into. What we need to talk about is mainly what you call manual handling, the manual work that we do that can be hazardous. So the reason why manual handling is a hazard is one, the physical demands of the work are high. Second, when you're manually handling patients, the weight of the patient can be heavy, bulky, I mean, can be a heavy load. A patient, 100 kgs, moving them will not be easy. The shape, the patient may be bulky or awkwardly shaped, or if it, if not a patient, anything can be awkwardly shaped. The behavior, you may have a confused patient who will fight you as you try to move them. Then high repetition tasks can be a hazard. Remember, if you're stacking files, in an area and you're doing it from morning till evening, the repetition can be a risk factor. And then remember equipment and facility design. If the space is too constricting in the workplace, it can be an issue. If it's poorly maintained equipment, it can be an issue. For example, machines that don't move very well, the cogs are stuck, the lighting is poor, all those can be an issue. Then you can also have poor work practices. For example, in KNH, in some areas, we have beds that are adjustable. They can go up and down. But the people who do not use them as the beds are made to be used. 
okay? So poor working practices. Then personal factors. Um, you have children, you have to carry them, you have to carry trash from your house to where you throw trash. You have to do shopping, you have to do yard work if you have a piece of land that you have to work on. Then you can also have previous injuries that may predispose you to more injuries. Remember, using body mechanics is not enough to prevent back injuries and other MSDs caused by manual patient handling or manual handling of any equipment or work. So this is how the hazard may occur. In standing, in sitting, you have compression forces top to bottom, as you can see in the diagram. Then if you're twisting, for example, stacking files, that means you have to rotate. As you rotate, there'll be forces in your lumbar area, because that's where you have most of the motion, L4, L5. Then as you move back and forth, you'll have a shear force happening at the bottom. So all those are hazards that could cause back injury, for example. So risk factors for MSDs, what are they? It could be acute, it could be chronic or cumulative. If it's acute, it means it's a one-time traumatic event or incident. So you fall, you slip, you fall, you trip, you hurt your ankle, you have a car accident, a machine falls on you, a patient falls on you. So all those are acute incidences of an injury. Then there's the chronic or cumulative incidences where you're constantly doing the same thing every time, either correctly or wrongly. And then with the buildup of this, you get an injury. In a nutshell, MSDs affect ligaments, muscles, tendons, cartilages, blood vessels, nerves, the spinal discs. So types of musculoskeletal disorders. Sorry for the yellows. Really quick, neck and shoulder disorders. You could have myofascial pain disorders. My friend, Wanayadi Tatayo, atazungumza via makuzi usuizo. Cervical spondylosis, the thoracic outlet syndrome, rotator cuff, tendinitis or tear. In the back, you could have a disc herniation, just easy, simple lower back pain, sciatic pain, that's pain radiating down. In the upper limbs, you could have all these diseases, decubinous disease, trigger finger, carpal tunnel, Guyan syndrome, and all the mentioned down there. But don't worry. As I said, my friend will cover them pretty extensively when it comes to his session. So risk factors. In the work setting, force. The force could be the weight or the mass of the patient, but majorly the weight. Okay. The awkward positions or awkward static posture that you have can also be a risk factor. Then the repetition of the activity can be a factor. The main factor actually is time. Force and time can cause an injury. Awkward position and time can cause an injury. Repetition over time will cause an injury. But in most cases, you have a combination of one, two, of or all three or four of them happening at the same time, pitching at even more risks. So let's talk about awkward posture. Awkward posture could simply be bending, twisting, reaching forward, kneeling, squatting, a pinch grip of a screwdriver or a hammer, okay? Awkward posture causes biomechanical stress to the joint and the surrounding tissues, which will be muscles and ligaments. When this happen, there's a decrease in the accelerating muscle, so you get fatigue and increases the risk of an injury simply because in an awkward posture, for example, leaning forward, there's, the, the, there's an acceleration of muscle fatigue in the lumbar muscular area, then you're predisposed to an injury. An example, providing medical care of for personal hygiene task when the patient is in a chair or bed that is too low. That means your back or your neck will be under strain. Or accessing a medical equipment, such as on a wall, for example, a suction machine, very familiar to people in the medical 
um, engineering department and the nursing department and physios, manual repositioning or transferring of a patient, manual repositioning or transferring of desks and tables. Okay. And these are quick pictures of awkward positions. You can see the gentleman there trying to reach in for something. Then as you look at the diagrams on the left and the right, I mean, top right and bottom, those are the awkward postures. So back flexion is an awkward position, back extension, awkward position, twisting of the waist right or left or lateral bending, all those are relatively awkward positions for the back. The normal is having a neutral straight up position. Then for the shoulder, an arm which is either in extension or flexion, that is a relatively awkward position. If the shoulder is in abduction or abduction and extension or flexion, all those are awkward positions that could predispose you to an injury. Then static or fixed postures are when you're just sitting. For example, researchers seated two, three, four, six, eight hours in front of a desk, working simply with your hands, so you do get muscle fatigue of your lower extremities, glute areas, back, probably shoulders, leading to predisp I mean, predisposing you to an injury. Examples for long standing or sitting, five to 12 hour surgical procedures, performing patient care tasks while bending for a few minutes, supporting a staff extremity or heavy instrument during a procedure. Then forces and MSDs, amount of physical exertion, that's what forces are, or muscle effort expended when performing a task or activity. The greater the force exerted, the higher the acceleration of muscle fatigue and increased risk of injury. So amount of force exerted is influenced by one, weight, shape, and condition of the patient or equipment. Your body posture used, the body posture used, the number of repetitions performed, duration or length of the task performed. Examples loading or shifting a patient suddenly or unexpectedly, lifting a bariatric or simply a large obese patient, pushing a stretcher with poorly maintained or incorrect casters. Those are the rollers, the roller, um, what are they called? The rollers that roll on the ground. Yeah. Repetition. This is simply performing the same motion over and over and over again. So what happened when all these risk factors come together? The duration of exposure will affect exposure will affect um, how you can get or will predispose you to MSDs. So the muscle cell system is exposed to a combination of these risks too quickly or too often or for too long without sufficient recovery or rest time, damage occurs. Okay. This is a chart just showing us how the cumulative effect occurs. So when you start out you're getting fatigue, you just feel tired, you're constantly tired, you can nyumbani ni mechoka ni mechoka. But hapo wasema wanza ku feel discomfort. Yaani mwili si yako, aisi ni kama ah I need a break. So you know, then from the discomfort you start moving into pain. So you could just be ah mgongo nasikia ya uma tu ile ile ucho ile maumivu ya uchovu. But hapo wasema sasa ni maumia. Kutoka maumivu then now you're disabled. We either needing a crutch, needing a back support or something. Okay, so this is a simple chart telling us the stages of cumulative injuries or cumulation of ergonomic injuries. So at the beginning, you're feeling an ache or fatigue and symptoms go away with rest. So when you go home, you feel tired, aching, ukipumzika subi ukosawa, apo ndo mwanzo wa shida. When you go to the second stage, why see maumivu, why see uchovu, but then the symptoms are present at work and also interrupt you when you go home. 
so you may not be sleeping very well. That means you're already into the second stage. And some of you will tell us that this is something they feel even now. The third stage, and now you're in pain, be it in rest position or not, if you're working or not working in sleep, you cannot sleep, you cannot rest, you're constantly in pain, that means you're already in the third stage of the MSD. Good, some of the high risk tasks, as we mentioned, were transfers, manual moving of patients in the bed, manual lifting from the floor, attempting to stop falls, long surgical or oral dental procedures, awkward overhead works, poor static postures. Now, let's talk about the natures of injury. So injuries and diseases often develop slowly over a period of months, at times even years. People will tell you, ah, Mugongo Ilianza Kuniuma three, four years ago. That means to something which was coming up and could have been sorted out early. So most workers will have signs and will have symptoms for a long period of time, indicating that something is wrong. E.g. worker may be uncomfortable while doing work, feeling aches, muscle joint pains over a period. And that's the nature of how injuries occur. So it's very important for us, for probably the organizational system, so either the matron or the in charges to doing quick, easy investigations to find out what kind of problems are there with your people so that we can prevent disability and diseases moving forward. Remember, a risk factor is not always a causation factor. The level of risk depends on one, length of time a worker is exposed to the condition, how often they are exposed, and the level of exposure. Usually a combination of multiple risk factors versus a single factor contribute to MSDs. For example, um, bedding forward could cause, bedding forward could cause lower back pain, okay? But remember, the people who have had very minimal exposure, I mean, very minimal incidences of lower back pain while they've been bending all their lives. So it may not be the causational factor of the lower back pain, but when you contribute to other factors, for example, bending forward and lifting heavy weights, then you are more at risk. Bending forward, lifting heavy weights, 20, 30, 50 times a day, then you're at more risk, okay? Bending forward, lifting a weight, and then twisting to the right or to the left, increasing the risks. Remember, do not focus solely on the workplace. You also have to think about outside the workplace, your home, your stairs, what do you do? Do you have a child? Do you carry the child? Do you work on your computer? You may be probably Kazi Huku, you are a surgeon, but then when you're at home, you're on your computer for six hours more doing a paper. So you have to think in terms of beyond the workplace, is there something else that you do that could be causing a musculoskeletal disorder? Remember, not everyone who's exposed to any of the risk factors will develop an MSD, okay? Individuals do not respond the same way to the same exposures. And predisposing factors such as age, arthritis, renal disease, hormonal imbalance, diet, hypothyroidism may play a role. Common causes of injury and disease. So poor design of chairs. So straight back chairs, hard surface chairs could be predisposing you to an injury sitting for long hours in a bad position. So the bad chair could put you in a bad position or you just, your computer is facing the right, your keyboard is facing the left. So you're in a bad position of your neck. Standing for long periods is a cause. Reaching out too far. So things should not be too far from you. Inadequate lighting, forcing the worker to move closer to the work area. Repeated use of a time or vibration tools and equipment such as a jackhammer, um, a power saw that I think surgeons and uh, orthopedic technologists use. So we have signs and we have symptoms. So 
pretty quick. When someone comes into my department and tells me, oh, I have, I cannot bend my knee fully. It's a quick sign or a patient calls me and tells me, I says, you can go to the mission. Now you are, that's a quick sign that something may be wrong. There could be a deformity. There could be decrease in strength, so weaker grip strength. There could be loss of muscle function. They can no longer probably lift something or move in particular position. Then the symptoms could be pain, numbness, tingling, burning, cramping, stiffness. Causes, as we've mentioned, and these are repeated, I think, once or twice moving forward. So we won't cover them again because I think we will touch on them in other slides. Remember, when we talk about MSDs, we're talking about the human body. We will cover the MSDs, but then also mention other things like the eyes and the ears. <laughs> in this case, just general uh, parts of the human body that will be affected by ergonomic injuries. And these are the key parts that we'll be looking at today. So the muscles. Remember, the activity undertaken determines the amount of blood flow into a muscle or into an area. Static efforts restricts the flow of blood through the muscles, leading to fatigue. Okay? So if you're sitting for a prolonged period, there'll be less blood flow into your lower extremities, maybe, and also into your arms causes less motion. So quick fatigue, then the muscles have less power, predisposing you to an injury. The position of the muscle above or below the heart is a factor to determine the quantity of blood flow. So if your arms are higher, it means less blood. If they are lower, so around your heart and below, then it means you get more blood into that area. So overhead wax tires the arm quicker simply because there's less blood flow, less oxygen and less nutrition to those muscles so that they can work. Blood circulation. So for effective circulation, you need a sound heart, you need sound lungs, okay? You need good oxygen transfer mechanism, must be impaired, I mean, you must not, you must be unimpaired by disease of any sort. Okay, so you, if you're a smoker, it means you have a bit of an impairment. If you have any other heart disease, it means you have an impairment. So good cardiac and thoracic health, I mean, cardiopulmonary health is important for good or proper economic workings. So good quality of air, so free of asphyxants or pollution. Remember, if you don't have blood into your brain for four minutes, you could have some irreparable damage. So blood circulation is highly important. The spine comprise of, I think, let me see, the cervical seven bones, thoracic 12, lumbar five, sacral another five. So very many bones, ligaments from bone to bone muscles to move them and to stabilize them. So there's a lot of things happening in the spine. Remember, the spine carries a large quantity of your body weight. So you have to think about it whenever we have an issue with ergonomics, very important. The disc, remember disc simply transmit loads along the spinal column and also allow the spine to bend and twist. So movement is allowed by the discs. Okay, remember when you're seated or walking or standing, you're loading those discs. Hence, you can, if you look on the side, on the diagram, you have a normal disc, a slight bulge, which is expected normal, simply because you're weight bearing. Then you have a bulge disc, which could be painful. Then you have a herniated disc, okay, which is maybe traumatic or chronic. Then you have degenerative disease, okay, or could just be thinning of the disc either from any of the above effects. So remember, extending or flexing the spine produces mainly tensile and compressive stresses on the disc, which may increase the magnitude going down the spine due to differences in body weight. So we have to think about the discs being damaged in standing, in sitting, or in motion, okay? Risk factors for the disc, as I said, is loading, 
when you're seated, it leads to pressure five times greater than when the spine is at rest, lying down. So if there's any more external weight on it, it means there's more pressure onto that disc. So we need to be careful about how we treat our discs. Okay, the neck. Neck pains and discomforts are mostly common symptoms associated with work, okay? So it could be heavy manual work or it could be work when you're seated, probably a secretary or a researcher. So both ways your neck could be affected. It could also be affected when you're using instruments, for example, vibrating tools, uh, uh, guys in maintenance and, and our surgeons, okay? Work organization could also affect how your neck is. So if your working area is not well organized, you could be swinging your neck simply because you have to turn a lot or your neck has to be twisted to one side simply to reach for something. Use of our phones could also affect our necks. So tensile headache could be felt. You could have neck and shoulder pains, difficulty in breathing. And that could simply come from seated long periods with your neck bent forward using your phone. Or seated in front of your computer if it's too low. Okay, the arms, important. So any work above will affect the blood flow into that area. The blood flow affected, high chance that you could get either an injury or a strain of your muscles or the joints around your neck, in, I mean, around your shoulder going into your arms. Okay. Remember, for continuous and effective working, the sweeping range of arms above should be restricted to between the center of the body and 45 degrees from the shoulder. Most effective lifting is done while standing provided the correct techniques are used. Remember the ability to handle loads while seated is much less when, than when you're standing. So when you're seated, you're, it's, it's a bit more awkward. So you have to strain a bit more to carry a load off the ground that is. The hand and wrist. Hands are grasping and gripping limbs. So when you have your grasping and, um, grasping and gripping limbs, the size of the object matters. So if it's too small, could be an issue. If it's too large, could be an issue. Could be an issue. How will you manipulate the tools that you want to use? Well, the resource allows motion from the palm towards the palm above, forward, back and forth. For example, when you're using a mouse, as you can see here. So the contact stresses is a possibility. Also straining when you're moving right to left. Repetitive motion can cause carpal tunnel syndrome, for example. And I believe my friend Wanayadi Ataipitia Komakini. Legs and feet. As you can see, the gentleman in that position, remember he's packing out food. So that means he'll be in that position for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Blood flow into the lower limbs may be affected. Okay, so blood flow in, blood flow out could be affected. So could lead to MSDs simply due to blood flow issues, as you can see. Hip injuries is possible because of the static position at the, because of the closed back position. Good, the eyes. So the eye ear line is about 15 degrees. So the, between your eyes and ears, about 15 degree of range. Normal line of sight is 15 degrees below the horizontal. Good. Eye movement can occur without discomfort within the cones of 30 degrees. So five degrees up, side to side as well. Okay. Luminance is calculated in lux. So lux is simply how much illumination there are in our area. So 150 to 200 lux is good enough for pedestrian area, walking area, the corridors, because it's a general, you don't need specific, specificity of sight. 
when you're in a working office area, you require about 500 to 1,000 lakhs, okay? Very close work. So when you're doing hand gravings, fine machine inspection, a surgery, you need up to 1,500 lakhs. So that's why when you go into an operating room, you see there are special lights, pretty bright, simply because of that. So if that is not something you're that is common, then it becomes an issue. You have eye issues, you have to strain your neck, your shoulders, and the like. So eye strain is manifested by headaches, stinging eyes, and fatigue. Ears. Remember, we need ears simply to hear either noise, sound, communicate, and the like. The normal ear responds to frequency between 20 hertz to, to 16,000 hertz. A threshold of hearing is zero decibel, 104 is on the extreme. Normal is between 70 to 90. So 75 decibels to 90 is our extreme. So 90, not comfortable, 75, perfect. Okay, so sound levels of 85 decibel can cause hearing damage in a small percentage of the population but most people are comfortable with it. 75 perfect, 85 is on the higher side, 90, 100 is a bit too much. So decibels should be around there. So whenever they're drilling some of the walls, the decibels go to way above 100 plus. So, and that's why they're very, very uncomfortable. But the ear has about 30,000 nerve cells. So <laughs> this can be damaged simply by the high levels of sound. Remember, sound also can be annoying, causing stress. Stress reducing your performance, reduce performance, leading to a risk of getting other MSDs. That's the end of my presentation. Pretty slow or fast. Um, I think we will let the questions come after the other presentation. So I'll let my friend uh, Banayadi and Kuzungumza about the MSDs, specifically from the neck going down to the lower extremities. Thank you very much. And I'll share the screen to you. I can share the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gerald. Um, whenever you know, whenever I hear of economics, I tend to think of our brothers and sisters in the banking industry. They're the ones who sit in front of the desk for long, uh, working on computers. But uh, it's been a good thing, Gerald. You've been able to contextualize uh, economics to our setup in, in the hospital. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, we, uh, the last time we spoke about economics was simply introduction. Uh, today, as Gerald has said, we are now talking about MSD. He's given a very good introduction. Uh, I was not able to, uh, to talk about all the conditions exhaustively, but uh, whatever, I uh, whatever I've prepared, I'm sure will be adequate enough. Uh, so my name is Wikliff Tatawi Yadi. Uh, and I want to dwell directly into presenting the MSDs. So why, 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 why learn about MSDs? Number one is because they are very common. Uh, number two, they can, they can be or become serious. Uh, if not, if for example, you can get a very simple MSD, but if not taken care of immediately, it can progress to something else. Uh, learning about them can help you alleviate your fears, for instance. Um, learning about MSDs can be very cost, I mean, MSDs can be very costly, not only to the individual, but to the organization or company you're working for, in terms of loss of man, man, man hours uh, while seeking Medicare. Uh, it can affect or change your lifestyle, 
of course, if you've got, if, if you've got MSDs that affect your movement, your quality of life is significantly affected. And if not taken care of at an early stage, it can cause permanent damage to uh, your anatomy. So you're going deep into economic straight ahead. We begin with the shoulder and neck disorders. If you look at the picture on the top right, the top right corner of your screen, uh, you can clearly tell that there's something wrong with that gentleman at the neck. So what are the associated risk factors? Uh, number one is for long static neck flexion and shoulder abduction or flexion. Another risk factor is lack of upper extremity support. I'm thinking of somebody who's working on a desk. Uh, number three, inadequate work breaks. You're supposed to have breaks between your work period so that you do a bit of stretches and uh, relaxation of your, your body tissues. Um, and that is going to be covered exhaustively in our next webinar in terms of managing MSDs. So uh, the first condition is my facial pain disorder. Uh, this is tenderness in the neck and shoulder, uh, radiating to the arms. And there's usually a tender note when you palpate the muscles uh, where the patient is having uh, symptoms. You, you might you, you might feel a, a, a nodule or what we call a, a tender knot point. And this is what we usually refer to as the trigger points. So these trigger points uh, usually cause referred pain. So you might be having a trigger point in your, uh, maybe at the, at, the, at the shoulder, but the pain is referred to the, to the forearm. Uh, then, then there's restricted range of motion. So possible causes uh, include overload of the neck and shoulder arms. Uh, stress and anxiety might result, might, might result to trigger points. Uh, second condition is cervical spondylosis. Cervical spondylosis uh, may be caused by intermittent, um, may, may present as intermittent or chronic neck and shoulder pain or stiffness. At times, patients may complain of headache. Uh, more often than not, there's harm, I mean, there's hand and arm pain. Then there's numbness, tingling, clumsiness, which may occur. Uh, the possible causes could be age related. They could be disc degeneration leading to uh, neuro, uh, neuro compression and spinal cord damage and also arthritis. Uh, looking at the image on the, on, on, on the right side, uh, I don't know if you can follow my cursor. Uh, you look at the anterior aspect of the cervical spine. Okay, generally there's degenerative changes in the, in, in, in the spine. But you're looking at these spikes over here, the anterior aspect. So these spikes, and then looking at the facet joints behind here, looking at how the disc has been uh, completely degenerated over here. So all these factors can result to uh, radiculopathy or radicular pain. Uh, remember the, the brachial plexus uh, has root values from C5 to T1. So any, anything uh, causing compression or uh, a kink on the nerve around this area will lead to radiculopathy and, and radicular pain. So another condition is thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, this usually presents the brachial plexus compression due to muscle tightness. Uh, on, this, on the side of the neck, or poor head position or slump posture. Some of the signs, signs and symptoms include numbness, tingling in the hand, which is made worse with overhead activities, while traveling phone between ear and shoulder. That, that, that is when, like, when you're receiving a call, before your phone gets to the ear, you're feeling some tingling and numbing. Uh, so some of the possible causes include compression of the nerve, blood vessels, uh, also trauma. Trauma can lead to such a, a presentation. Uh, another uh, possible cause is slouching forward or dropping the shoulders. Uh, 
I want to draw your attention to the image on the uh, on the on the bottom uh, right of your screen. Uh, looking at the brachial plexus, you see them coming down over here. They divide now the they, they divide. There's a anterior and a posterior division over here of the cords. Uh, so before before they form the anterior posterior division, just beneath the the clavicle and the first rib, you can see a, a, an enlargement on the side over here. That is where the the problem occurs. So you can see if there is no enough space over here, there there can be compression of either of these structures, and that can lead to presentation of the symptoms. Uh, I've, I've spoken about uh, trauma. Uh, uh, one very uh, important, I mean, well, one very uh, relative case study is one of the patients uh, we are seeing in the world right now. He's a tout. What happened was his friend pulled his arm, uh, his right arm, and suddenly he developed weakness of both upper limbs. So we're working with him uh, with a diagnosis of uh, central cord syndrome. Uh, it was interesting to note that it, it, it was only a pull. Somebody just pulling your arm, and then you, you end up losing power in the upper. Another condition is rotator cuff tendinitis, or tears. So usually, pain, um, patient presents with a dull pain and stiffness in the shoulder associated with backward and upward arm movements. Then they also present with weakness of the rotator cuff muscles. Remember the, the rotator cuff muscles, as you can see the image over there, rotator cuff muscles, uh, that, that green patch highlighted over here is uh, showing the rotator cuff. These are the tendons of the subscapularis. This is the, this is the tendon of biceps, lo, uh, biceps longus. And then above here, just beneath the, uh, uh, just above the acromion, coming to the greater trochanter is the supraspinatus. Then posteriorly, you usually have the, the uh, infraspinatus just below the spinous process of scapula. Then all of them form the rotator cuff. So any damage to any of the tendons over here, a tear or a, an impingement, not an impingement, a tear or a, a, a sprain would result to what we call a tendinitis of the, of the rotator cuff. So any of the, any of the tendons affected over here would, would, would classify that as uh, rotator cuff tendinitis. So possible uh, causes is swelling and tearing of the rotator cuff, just as I've said, shoulder joints, bony spurs. Some of the some of the patients may present because of the morphology of the acromion process. Uh, some patients have a, a, a big uh, acromion process. Some have one that is a bit flat. Uh, so the one that is a bit flat allows uh, better movement than the bit big tends to kink on a bit of the vessels that predispose individuals to such a condition. Uh, so uh, next we go to hand and wrist disorders. The risk factors include chronic repetitive movements as Gerard had earlier on alluded and uh, abnormal awkward positions of wrist, mechanical stress, to digital nerves such as sustained grasps and instrumental, I mean instrument handles, then a forceful work, extended use of vibration, vibratory instruments, inadequate work breaks. Uh, looking at that image over there, uh, one of the mouses has been slightly lifted up to allow uh, proper motion in the wrist. The one above is a bit not giving enough uh, anatomical relaxation of the wrist. So if you can uh, if you can adapt to this, the, the one in the bottom in the bottom I mean at the bottom called the vertical mouse is a bit better when it comes to if you're if you're working in the computer for 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 a, for a longer duration because it alleviates the pressure below the wrist. The next is the Quavin's disease. So what happens is the patient presents with pain in the thumb and wrist area when grasping, pinching, or twisting. Uh, the swelling is usually at the thumb, 
and at the base of thumb most of the most of the time if you look at that image over there that is the classical presentation of this condition the patient will complain with pain emanating from the from the base of thumb and usually the tendons that are mostly affected i'm sorry about that diagram it's a bit on the side but it's showing the tendons that are most affected of the thumb uh, that is abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Those are the two tendons that are most affected, mostly affected in this condition. In this, in this condition. So what happens is there is decreased range of motion of thumb with pain. Pain, pain, pain is really the main uh, complaint. Possible causes: synovial sheath swelling, thickening, thickening of tendons at the base of the thumb repeated trauma or twisting of hand and wrist motions. Take an example of somebody who has to tight screws uh, or sorry about that. Take an example of somebody who has to 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 tighten screws or um, I mean anyone who's who's doing repetitive wrist motions, you can cause that uh, overload of the, the tendons over there. Another example of hand and wrist disorders is trigger finger tenosynovitis. So what happens in this condition is there is, there's, there's inflammation of the flexor tendons of either of the digits of the hand, so pain during movement that places the tendons in tension, warmth, swelling, tenderness of the tendon when palpated are some of the uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, patient will present with what you're seeing on the bottom left, on, on the bottom right of your screen, uh, but it can affect any digits, not necessarily the index or the middle finger or, or whatever finger, any of the fingers can be affected depending on which one has been over, overworked or which one has resulted into inflammation. Post, possible causes sustained forceful, uh, powerful grip or repetitive motion. So all of these, sim, sim, I mean, all of these diseases, they have almost a similar classical presentation of uh, symptoms, which is the number one complaint is usually pain. Uh, this, the second one is usually inflammation. And then when you come to possible causes, a lot of these conditions are as, as a result of repetitive motions. And that is why we are trying as much as possible to contextualize uh, the presentation of the disease to our scope of topic today, which is ergonomics. Another uh, example is carpal tunnel syndrome. So what happens with carpal tunnel? I think it's, uh, it, 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 it's it's good if we remind ourselves what passes through the carpal tunnel. We've got the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon, the median nerve, flexor pollicis longus tendon, then uh, flexor digitor digitorum uh, profunda, uh, the four tendons. So the, the culprit here is usually the, the median nerve. Any, uh, any uh, irritation on the median nerve around this area will lead to the presentation on the top right screen. That is the area that, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at the, uh, the palm aspect of your hand, this is the area supplied that the, by the median nerve. So patient will, will present with numbness and pain around these areas. Then eventual, eventually there will be muscle weakness and atrophy. Now, the, the, when the disease progresses, you look at the the, the thinner eminence of this uh, patient over here. Look at the arrows. There is evident uh, atrophy, and then symptoms often worse with increased activity. So whenever a patient tries to do uh, whatever they were engaging in before the symptoms worsen. Uh, so pain and tingling 
that awakens the patient at night. The, such patients have nocturnal pain. So basically, you know this. Uh, it, 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 it's biomechanical. It, 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 it's it's biochemical kind of pain rather than bi biomechanical when pa when pain wakes you up at night. Uh, some of the possible causes: compressed median nerve at the level of the wrist, canal, due to trauma or the repetitive motions, as we said. Then uh, awkward movements or deviations of the wrist, causing pressure on the on the median nerve, and also uh, a defect in atrial circulation around that area can result to pain. Cubital tunnel syndrome, this is another condition occurring at the cubital fossa. This is an area at the elbow. Uh, at least once in a while, somebody has knocked their elbow on a, on a table or a sharp edge and feel some radiating pain in the antebrachium. So this, this, is, this is usually the, the area that is affected. Uh, looking at the image on the bottom, uh, bottom right of the screen, the green area, that is the, the medial, ep medial epicondyle. And then, uh, you know, medial epicondyle is the blue area, then the olecranon, uh, tip of ole olecranon is a bit lower. So in between there, that is where we have the, 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 the ulnar nerve passive. So a repetitive motion that would cause uh, strain to the nerve at that area can lead to pain radiating to the forearm, pain and numbness, tingling and impaired sense of touch in the little finger, little and ring finger. That is the areas that, that are supplied by the ulnar nerve. Yeah? Loss of fine control, reduced grip, possible, some of the possible causes include compressed ulnar nerve in the elbow, just as I've said, can be direct trauma as well. The other condition is radio tunnel syndrome. Now we, we are now we are looking at where the radius passes at the elbow. Now it's not within the elbow joint; it's a bit supi, I mean, an, a, a bit anterior. And the radial tunnel, if you can look at the image right there, the radial tunnel is this portion over here. So patient come patient comes with a pinpoint kind of pain that is not really pinpoint, but uh, pain emanating from that area, but also radiating to the forearm in areas supplied by the radial nerve. That would be classical for uh, radial tunnel syndrome. So it could happen due to compression of the nerve, uh, signs and symptoms, as I've said, from elbow to base of thumb with wrist and weakness, a common sign. Sensation from elbow to base, of thumb with wrist and weakness of weakness is a common is a, is a common symptom. Sorry. <laughs> Lateral and medial epicondylitis. So this this basically is uh, uh, what we call tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. So tennis elbow is uh, golfer's elbow is medial epicondylitis and Tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. This is more common in people involved in racket games, but it can it can affect people working in hospital as well, because basically it's repetitive motion at the elbow joint, resulting to either of the presentations, as you've seen in that slide. Reynolds phenomena. It's another condition of hand and wrist. So intermittent spasm of finger and toe, blood vessels causing blanching, numbness, and pain. Increased sensitivity to cold. Those are some of the signs and symptoms. Uh, so Reynolds phenomena has quite a number of causes. Uh, but although we are trying as much as possible to minimize our scope in ergonomics, just in mentioning, uh, Reynolds phenomena can be caused by atherosclerosis, can be caused by drugs that cause narrowing of the arteries, certain autoimmune diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Smoking is also a risk factor. 
But now, because we are talking about ergonomics, we want to measure our cause of this condition in repetitive injuries, e.g. typing, heavy use of hand, and et cetera. So actually, when it's not only atherosclerosis or, uh, or rheumatoid arthritis that can cause uh, Reynolds. Actually, even repetitive motions can result to this, especially if you are a smoker as well. Uh, now we go to back disorders. I think this is the elephant in the room. As I, if I can remember the, in our initial presentation, Gerald uh, spoke about quite a huge number of nurses coming in for low back pain. And we, we were trying to allude that to uh, the, the kind of job they, 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 are, they are exposed to. So indeed, there's no single person who will tell you they've never, they've never, they've never had pain in the lower back. The only, the only difference is how severe you are scored. So risk factors, awkward posture, improper lifting, excess weight, that means not, not, not excess, like your weight, not excess lifting excess weight, but like having excess weight. Then leading a sedentary lifestyle. And of course, age can be a factor. So examples of back pains can be upper or lower as shown in that diagram, but majority of people complaining of back pain is usually low back pain. And then uh, we can have herniated disc as Gerald has spoken about earlier on. Then the piriformis syndrome and sciatica, they marry each other. I don't want to look at sciatica as a, as a diagnosis rather than a symptom because Remember, the sciatic nerve pierces the piriformis muscle. So an, an, an inflammation of the piriformis muscle will result to sciatica. We're going to look at sciatica briefly. So these are some of the conditions of the back as a result of ergonomics. I uh, want to look at herniated disc, though Gerald had, had already spoken about it. Uh, looking at the diagram on the side, a normal disc looks the way that one looks. This one, that is how a normal nerve looks. I mean, a normal disc. A uh, degenerated disc has, you know, the, the disc itself is made of the fibrous annulosus and the nucleus pulposus. So the fibrous annulosus is the outer part of the disc. The nucleus pulposus is the mid, middle part of the disc. So the middle part of the disc is usually made of gel which now helps in dissipation of forces as had been spoken about earlier. But now, uh, because the disc has what we call water imbibing capacity, when we grow, as we grow, we tend to lose water from the, from the, from the disc itself. So there could be age-related degeneration, but at the same time, we can have uh, degeneration due to overuse. Now we, we want to relate that with ergonomics. Yeah? So the herniated disc, this is how it looks like. Uh, you can see posteriorly here. And this is where the, we have uh, nerve roots emanating to go and supply whichever part they are going to from the, from the cord. Then we, have, we usually have thinning or decreased joint space. And now we have osteophytic changes kicking in, kicking in at later stages. So what happens is we have back and leg numbness, tingling, pain, and weakness, uh, which worsens with coughing, sneezing, sitting, driving, bending forward. Possible causes would be bulging of the fragment. I mean, bulging or fragmenting of intervertebral discs into spinal canal, as I've explained right there with herniated disc. So this could cause compression on the nerve, irritating the spinal nerves. And also he excessive heavy lifting without adequate rest and predispose. Low back pain. Uh, low back pain, number one is just pain. <laughs> pain, pain, pain. So uh, looking at the diagram over there, this gentleman over here is not lifting that load properly. You see now he's slouching his uh, 
thoracic and lumbar region. Same, same to this guy. This is not the correct posture of lifting uh, an object from the floor. And then after lifting, it, after lifting it up, you're not supposed to hyperlodot your back if, the, if there exists a word like that. If you, if, if you, I mean, if you, if there's hyperlodosis of the lower back, then you're causing pressure posteriorly. This over here is the correct posture of lifting an object from, from the floor. And then when you're working with patients, at least you can improvise a band around the waist of a patient. And then uh, you pivot your, your knee together with that of the patient so that you, can, you are able to lift the patient, whether it's off the bed to the wheelchair or vice versa. So this helps you, gives you mechanical advantage by using this uh, improvised stroke over here. You can use a, 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 a what do you call it? You can use a towel, you can improvise with a towel or a shawl around the, the waist of a patient. So what happens with low back pain is stiffness in the lower spine and surrounding tissues. Possible causes, as we've explained earlier on, all, all these things are just due to repetitive, awkward uh, postures and poor biomechanics. Sciatica. Signs and symptoms, the dull, sharp pain from the lower back or hip radiating to the buttocks and legs. So the diagram over there explains where the patient would come complaining of pain, either at the sole of foot, uh, at the calf muscles, around the popliteal area. Uh, those are the most common signs of complaints of pain from patients presenting with sciatica. As, as I said earlier on, sciatica can be you can actually get sciatica from, it, it could be discogenic, that is from a root above, I mean, from a root emanating from the lumbar region in the, in the lumbar sacral plexus. Or you can also have a, a lesion in the course of the nerve itself. Like for example, now having a piriformis syndrome, it, the, the muscle is tight, compressing on the nerve itself. So you get, pain going down the legs. So that, that is uh, sciatica, but uh, physios depend mostly on uh, clinical signs. So you, they are able to tell whether this is piriformis syndrome or sciatica from something else, maybe a, a root compression or something before even checking on images. So clinical signs and symptoms, I mean, no, uh, clinical uh, diagnostic tools are very important in differential diagnosis. So what happens is you have leg, leg weakness, numbness, or tingling. Uh, probable causes, I've already mentioned them. And lastly, when I was preparing this, I came about this uh, phrase over here. It says, sorry, using your brain too much is not a repetitive <laughs> motion injury. So keep using your brain. Keep adding more information and God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I think um, we've had um, several people saying that it is a really nice presentation. And one of the things um, that I'm learning going forward is that as medical, of, as medical practitioners, we should be also taking care of ourselves, even as we take care of our patients. So we need to look at the musculoskeletal injuries that we get, our posture, how we um, go about um, our work and ensure that we live long to be able to take care of our patients. There's a question here from Galaxy J2, um, asking what kind of a repeat trauma, asking you to repeat on hand disorders. Um, which sort of traumas cause which hand disorders? Sorry, Doc, come again, please. Um, the question is about hand disorders. Uh -huh. uh, and 
and the question they're asking is in terms of what sort of repeated traumas at work can cause which sort of harm disorders? Oh, thank you so much. As you said earlier, on, any 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 motion, any repetitive motion, like for instance, the wrist. Uh, take an, a good example of the, the our surgeons when when they're performing what they do best in theater. You see, they, they, there's that motion, there's that repetitive motion of your wrist deviating, deviating from uh, the, 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 the anatomical uh, position, either ala or radial. And then uh, looking at uh, people who are working in front of a computer, uh, as Gerald said earlier on again, uh, researchers, you, if you're not positioning your, your, your wrist well, you end up uh, causing uh, repetitive motions on the wrist. And this could, 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 could end up in an inflammatory process setting in, and then you end up with the conditions that you've said. Thanks. I think adding on to it, um, pretty simple. People working in our kitchens, they get, um, someone needs to cut probably 30 cabbages for the department. Cutting 30 cabbages, that means we'll be in one position, up, down, up, down with the knife for about an hour and a half. That repetitive motion, arm, wrist. You can get quick inflammation of your wrist into your hand. Um, maintenance gentleman opening up um, machines. So probably the screwdriver opening up maybe 10 computers opening the back one after the other. That means screw motion round and round, 10, 20, 30 minutes, 15, 20, 30 computers just to do maintenance. That's a repetitive motion of the hand and wrist that could cause an MSD. Hence, other countries, you go in, if you need to do hammering, you won't use a hammer. You'll use probably, what is it called? I mean, if, if you're not using nails, you use um, screwdrivers. They love a machine that screws in all the screwdrivers and can open the same. Some countries also have machines that cut vegetables and cabbages so that you reduce that predisposing someone to the, those injuries. Um, thank you, Gerald, for that. Um, I'm not sure whether it's my internet that cut off. Um, so I didn't hear the last bit of your statement. Um, but there's a question here from Imran, um, who's asking that you discuss about plantar fasciitis and the remedies for plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis, um, pretty simple. That's what it is. The fascia and the plantar surface gets inflamed. What can inflame it? Either repetitive action, that is wearing bad shoes. If you're a sportsman, the repetitive motion of running could cause plantar fasciitis. If you are working in an area where you need to stand for a long period and you have improper shoes, it could cause a stretch on your plantar fascia giving a strain, hence inflammation. So weight reduction, as Imran has eluded, can help in reducing that force on the plantar fascia. But best thing is good footwear. So let's not name drop. Hush puppies are wonderful shoes, very good insoles, do wonders to feet. But you can also get a cheaper thing. Go look at a hash puppy in gear butter. Look at the shoe. Look at how it is. Look at the insole. Get something cheaper with the same kind of specifications. If not, if you already have plantar fasciitis, you can come into our department. You can have a look because your problem may be either a strength issue. So maybe you have weak muscles in your leg causing a strain going into your plantar fascia. We could work on that. 
or it could be your plantar fascia is just tight. So we need to loosen the plantar fascia and the muscles in the surrounding area. So you come in, we can work on that, then give you exercise programs to ease it off. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I think the bigger question that is there right now is we can't change our work. How do we change our workplaces to accommodate and to ensure that we don't get the musculoskeletal diseases? Because um, individually, everyone has complaints of this or the other. But then this comes from our workplaces, and we need our workplaces to be able to provide the basic necessities. So how do we, what do we do to change the environment? So now that will be covered extensively by Peter Araka and Emily Koske next week, because they are covering controls and how to prevent MSDs and economic, economic injuries. So that's a whole topic that they're going to cover next week from, I think, there, there are, I think, three or four levels of doing it. I mean, how it's done. So covering it today will be a bit difficult. So it will be covered extensively next week. Unless you want us to allude into, give you a cheat sheet as to what's coming next week, but it will be covered well next week. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, there's a question, I think, um, uh, one of the last questions so that we can give you a parting shot. Um, the question here, and I hear, and I know this has been a confusion amongst many people. What's the difference between a bulging disc and a herniated disc? Uh, and how do you tell how, and what do you do for both? Let me just open up my screen to show it again. Just one second. Oh. just get into that screen and then explain it real, real quick. So, wow, just a bit again. Sorry for that, here we are. Good. A bulging disc means the contents that I talked about, the gel contents of the disc are still intact. As you can see here, there's nothing. I mean, there's no rupture. There's no um, damage on the outer cover of the disc. On the bulge, the surface is still well covered but the contents are bulging out a bit. It's like when you have a balloon and you squeeze it, it doesn't bust out, but what happens is it bulges to one side. That's how bulging disc is, as you can see here. But then a herniated disc is when now the contents of the disc pour out into the outer bit of the spine. It will be held by the ligaments and the fascia around it, but it appoints a toka from the disc itself. That's the difference between a bulging and a herniated disc. Degenerative simply means the outer cover, the annular sparcosis, has damage to the point that it is not, the integrity cannot hold the fluid in. Okay? So you're losing that fluid really quick, and that's how you, that's how we get degener degenerated disc. Then the thinning disc is when either one, but mostly degenerative disease, causes the fluid to reduce so much that there's close, I mean, there's some contact of bone to bone from each spine, from the spine to the next. I hope that makes sense. 
Yes, that makes sense. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of today's session. I think it's a bit, it's been a really good presentation. Um, so I'd like to give the presenters an opportunity to tell us their parting shots. I'll start. Um, I mean, there's a Mariam Zivo who had a question much earlier. We didn't answer it. I think it's a concern. She says she had sciatica 2015. The pain was managed through physio. She's lived pain-free till last year when the pain came back. Her question is, can sciatica be healed permanently? Truth be told, in all my studies, all through school, they say back pain can never be cured back pain can be managed, okay? You can only manage back pain. Sciatica, we can relieve the sciatica. Talking about a permanent solution is difficult because once you start moving and walking, you're already predisposed to getting another episode. But you can work and manage the point of you can be pain-free most of the time or nearly all the time, and then you know when to seek help for it. So, Permanent solution is know yourself and know when you need to get checked. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, I think uh, as, we, as we work, uh, as, as, as Doc said, we, we should also look at how best we can take care of us, ourselves. We help the patients, but we, we should also know that we are also potential patients. So however much we want to serve the patients, we should take uh, uh, great concern on the biomechanics and uh, how we do what we do. Um, and I think that is going to be covered next week, how to prevent MSDs in economics. Thank you very much. Um, General Gamondi, any parting shots as we come to the end? What I'd say is know your work environment. Know your, you know your, the person next to you, okay? Remember, the signs come early. Be careful of the signs. Fatigue, aching. You're tired when you get home, more tired in the morning, something is coming up. The best time to sort it out is before it becomes a problem. So sort of a problem before it becomes a problem, then I think we'll have better and safer working areas. So know yourself, know how you feel, take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation today. And I think um, people have learned a lot, um, especially how to detect um, the musculoskeletal injuries that may occur because of our workplaces. Um, again, um, the recordings of the session will be uploaded on the YouTube page, KNHS YouTube page. Even on our website, the KNH website, you'll be able to get um, our the recording of the of every recording that you want to hear about um, in terms of cpd points we are working on um, sorting out the issue of uploading it on the pharmacy and poisons board portal but in the meantime we will use the self-reporting mechanism um, so that you do not get denied from getting the cpd points and if you have any challenges kindly email us at knh um, cpd at gmail.com and we'll be able to address all the concerns that you have. Thank you very much to all our panelists and attendees. Um, without you, this webinar would not be possible. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>